Good morning, everybody. We are, like I said, we are starting right at nine o'clock. I want to thank you all for being here. So you guys are here for the batteries and household hazardous waste class. We will be identifying the hazards that come with both of these and then how to avoid them. My name is Tara Mae Albert and I will be one of your presenters and host for this class. I am the Solid Waste Operator Training and Certification Coordinator for the State of New Hampshire. This class is specifically for solid waste operators who are looking to gather information on managing batteries and household hazardous waste for their solid waste facilities. We invite any stakeholders to also participate and follow along along the way. Before we get started, I do have a few logistics and housekeeping issues to go over with you. First off, you guys should have a toolbar on your screen that looks like this. You can minimize it by clicking this orange rectangle with the uh, white arrow. Uh, you can make that smaller and larger. You can also raise your hand if you've got questions. You can raise your hand and then I can contact you through the chat function or the questions function. Uh, you also can just go straight to the questions function here and type in your questions for the day. A, doc, a box will pop up and allow you to, to type that in. Um, also, we do have a few handouts for you today and underneath the questions pane is a handout section. There are three of them. Uh, in there, you'll find documents that are pertinent to the training, including um, a sign-in sheet for anyone has, who has more than one person in the room. Also, if you're having any technology issues, if you are on VPN, disconnect and come back to the webinar. Um, remember to copy and save that link so you can hop right back in. Our the system will document that you did have a glitch in your in your system, and then it'll pop. It'll show that you pop back in. There also, if you are having issues hearing, there is an audio pin, and what you would do is you would go to this audio portion right here and click that down and then you can choose a different way to come into the system if you're having audio issues. So other housekeeping issues. As always, stay hydrated during the class. Uh, I know it's a long three hours to be sitting, but make sure you guys are staying hydrated. And then if you do happen to use a single use container, make sure to recycle it. Usually this is also the place where we talk about using the restrooms and getting up and, and moving. Well, of course, we're not at DES today, but I want you to know if you do need to walk away from your computer for a few minutes, that's completely fine. You can get up, stretch, go to the, the restroom. The purpose of this is to let you know you can move around, but do come back because I do get to see who's left their computer for a long period of time. I get um, a notification that someone is not paying attention. Also, make sure that you are muted. We will be keeping everyone muted during this class, but if for some reason uh, we do unmute you to ask a question, and uh, if you can't remute yourself, make sure that you stay muted during this workshop. I am also obligated, since it's a training event, to tell you about our about emergency exit. If there is an emergency, know where your exit is to get out of the building that you're in. Um, and don't worry about the class. We will figure out uh, continuing professional development hours after your emergency is complete. Also, throughout the day, we are going to be throwing out some polls. Uh, this works best in full screen mode. Um, just so you guys can see what it looks like, I'm going to put throw the first poll out there. All right, and I've launched that. So you just click on the best answer for you. So besides yourself, how many other people are participating today under your login? And when these polls roll out, I'm either going to give you one minute or look to see to, for us to get to 90% voted. A few more. We're almost at a minute and we're at 81% voted. Let's see if we can get to that 90. Oh, 
All right, so I'm gonna share it so you guys can see. So 68% of you said it's just you, that's fine. 23% said one to two, um, and then there were 5% for three and four and more than four, which is completely fine. The reason that I ask this specific question is for taking attendance. So I can see who signs in, who who is signed in. I can see how long you are registered in the class. Uh, we also see individual attention. So who's paying attention, who's shopping on Amazon. Um, and then we submit these poll questions and we can gather how much engagement there is. Also, if there are multiple people in the room for you, we will account for that. Please either use the sign-in sheet in the documents pane or the sign-in sheet that I emailed to you yesterday or create a sign-in sheet with the printed name of each person plus the signature. So you guys need to submit these uh, sign-in sheets at the time of renewal. So if there's 10 of you sitting in the room, each of you need to make a copy of that sign-in sheet at the end of the class and then include that with your renewal form uh, when you do renew for your continuing professional development. Also, we will have a survey and evaluation that will go out tomorrow. Please remember to be truthful in your assessment of the class, but as always, be kind. And this time, the response is not anonymous. So we will see who, who's, who's giving us the reviews. A few more logistics for the day. We will take a quick Q&A break after each presentation so you guys can type your questions in. You can raise your hand and we may or may not unmute you. We may ask those to be typed rather than unmuted. Uh, we will take approximately 15 minute break. It just depends on how we're doing on time, um, about halfway through the agenda. Also, we are recording this session, so no pressure there, but we are recording it. Before we get going, why did we choose this topic? Why are we talking about batteries and household hazardous waste? Well, it's pertinent to complying with your permit. It affects you and your customers on a daily basis. As we all know, batteries are becoming more diverse and they are becoming more of an issue. The chemical makeup. It's ever changing. So we're always going to have a different presentation when it comes to batteries. We're going to be telling you about something different. Also with household hazardous waste, it changes. The chemistry changes. And then there's the obvious reasons. How many of you have seen over the last year, two years, an increase in fires, an increase in injuries? Uh, Yes, definitely fires with these new types of batteries. The safety of you, for of you, your customers, and everyone around you and the environment comes into play. We also have a video to share with you. Uh, I would ask that our other two presenters let me know to make sure that you can hear the video. If you cannot, I've got another way to play it. So let's see if it plays. I'm not hearing anything. I don't hear anything. You're any not? Audio. No. Was that no, you cannot hear it? I cannot. OK. All right, hang on one second. I've got one other way to try it. As always, I've got to back up. I can hear that.
So we chose to show that video rather than just standard pictures because it's gut-wrenching. Uh, I will preface this by saying that uh, they were in California uh, and in California, they recycle the nine volt batteries where in, in New Hampshire right now, they can be thrown into the trash. Um, I will be providing the link to that video uh, for those of you who could not hear it. I know there's a couple of people that commented they couldn't hear or they want the video. We will be linking that um, to sending that to you guys as well. As for the agenda, we'll be talking about the types of batteries. We're going to be going over again dangers and hazards associated with those batteries. Options for disposal of batteries, management of batteries at your facility. There will be an activity. It's not going to be as robust as what you guys are used to seeing with us because it's kind of hard through this system to do um, activities. We're going to be talking about used oil and HHW grants how different ways that HHW events can affect cost. And then it's a quick blurb on how to educate your residents before the HHW event. You wanna have a successful event, uh, you need to educate your residents and let them know what's going on. Before we get going, I wanna introduce you to the other two presenters for the day. So I would ask Dean and Sean to uh, turn on their cameras real quick, just so I can introduce you guys and, um, tell you a little bit about them. So Dean Robinson came to DES in 2005 and he's been in charge of the Household Hazardous Waste Program since 2007. Prior to coming to DES, Dean worked for several state and federal agencies including the U.S. Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Management, Seabrook Nuclear Power Station, and the United States Army as a salvage diver and nuclear biological and chemical weapons specialist. In addition to HHW, Dean is also a certified New Hampshire lean facilitator and volunteers as a public speaking mentor with the DES Speechcraft program. Second is Sean Plassey. He is the Northeast Regional Program Manager for Call to Recycle, the country's largest, most reliable battery recycling program. He manages both corporate and government accounts, assisting with EPR compliance, legislation, safety, and environmental best management practices. Previously, he worked in the solar and wind energy industries for Sun Common, Tesla, Solar City, and Second Wind, and he owned a green building business in Burlington, Vermont, where he still resides. Call to Recycle administers over 16,000 collection sites in the United States and Canada, working on behalf of corporate stewards to optimize collection, share experience and expertise, and responsibly manage the end-of-life batteries and other materials. Please contact Sean directly to join Call to Recycle's battery program, purchase cell block lithium fire safety products, or request a speaking engagement. All right, guys, so I am going to, at this point, pass it the baton to Dean. And then if you guys who are watching have any questions or need to chat with me, go ahead and ask those questions and I will get to you um, once we get Dean all set up and ready to go. So we're doing all types right. of batteries first. Mm -hmm. I am passing that right to you what and I'll let you know. All right. And you are set. I'm going to turn my microphone off. Thank All you. right. Good morning, everybody. Types of batteries. This is uh, I my camera just switched. I can't see my presentation anymore. What happened to it? There we go. All right. And now, there we go. Types of batteries. So we're going to talk about button cells. We're going to talk about alkaline batteries along with lead acid, car batteries, lithium batteries, and of course, rechargeables. And when I refer to lithium batteries, I am talking about the non-rechargeables. Those are the disposable lithiums. <clears throat> Button cell batteries, mysterious little things, uh, kind of a pain in the butt if you're trying to sort them. Like all batteries, they do have a positive and a negative. And the nomenclature is very hard to read. Unless it specifically says mercury or lithium, it's hard to tell what's in there. So if you're going to be sorting these batteries into different categories, you're gonna to want to understand the different nomenclatures. And you may have to keep cheat sheets. A lot of times the information is on the package, but not the battery. And you're not getting them when they're new, you're getting them when they're old. So you don't get to see that information. You don't have that luxury. So we treat them as universal waste. They are a battery. We can do that. 
how many of you guys, well, I can't see you, but I'm curious how many uh, of your facilities have a universal waste bucket similar to this one. This is a one gallon one, but it can be five gallons as long as it's properly labeled. And you can put any type of mercury containing device or battery into this thing. And it's usually pretty affordable. So if you don't have one, I'd recommend uh, researching that and getting one. So let's talk about alkaline batteries. So anything toxic in uh, alkaline batteries was removed around 1984. And that's not to say you won't see a battery older than 1984. I have gotten calls from people who say, hey, I've got this weird camera battery from 1953. Somebody was cleaning out their attic and found it and you really have to look at it. We do a little research, find out what's in it. As long as they're post-1984, they are okay to put into solid waste. It's not the best option, but it's usually the most affordable. Uh, some vendors can recycle them. I uh, recommend you do a little research, that whole cradle to grave thing. Uh, there was one company, they had a program where you could put your uh, alkalines in with your rechargeables, and they said they were recycling them. We did a little tracking. We found out they were just hauling them up to Canada and landfilling them. So take a little responsibility if you're going to go with a vendor and find out, hey, what do you actually do with them? Lead acid batteries, they're pretty self-explanatory. It's a heavy metal in an acid bath. They're usually a money maker. Well, they used to be. You know, the market it flows up and down, but a lot of times they uh, they make you guys money, so you do want to manage them correctly. So number one, you want to separate the poles, just like any smaller battery. Uh, don't let them touch. Don't set things on top of them. You must be able to inspect them. So once you palletize them, once you separated the poles, if you put them up against the wall or in a corner and there's a leak, you won't know it until it's too late. And you wanna keep them on an impervious surface. You don't wanna store them out on the dirt somewhere because that's gonna to lead to bigger problems. Here's a pretty good example. Pallets are well, the uh, layers are well separated. The poles are not touching. It's on an impervious surface. It also has a sump pallet. Uh, if there is a leak, it should go into the sump, but it looks like somebody put a sheet of plywood between the sump and the battery, so I'm not sure what the purpose of that was. The only feedback I have, it's a little hard to inspect in that back corner. It looks like it's up against the back wall. So I move it out a little bit, a foot or two, so you can get back there and see what's going on. And this is an excellent way to manage and store your batteries. Let's talk about lithium and lithium ions really quick. A lot of these have been in the news a lot lately. Every, every time you see something burning down, somebody ingests one of these things, it's usually a lithium battery that's the culprit. Uh, Sean will definitely recognize that car. <laughs> that's the Tesla. Uh, first generations, th these cars were amazing. They all had one thing in common though, and that was this thing right here 1200 pound battery, over 7,000 cells. And they were known for doing one thing catching on fire. Uh, same thing happens in other, oops, we jumped ahead. And it wasn't unique to this. They were having this problem with phones. They were having it with all kinds of lithium batteries. Technology just wasn't quite there yet. We're a lot better now. Uh, rechargeable batteries. Some of these batteries are very easy to identify, like the one on the bottom of that drill. They just look like a rechargeable battery. Some of them look exactly like alkaline batteries. And you have to get in there and you have to read. Uh, one thing I want you to remember is that a rechargeable battery equals a recyclable battery. To my knowledge, there's no rechargeable battery we can't recycle. And well, chemically we can recycle it. Sometimes we don't have the infrastructure to recycle it like that great big Tesla battery you saw, but it can be recycled if you have the vendor. Uh, one of the things I would like to mention, do I mention it here? No. If you're going to sort batteries, get some sort of a magnifying glass. And I think I'll mention this later on in the presentation. But a lot of people have a hard time reading those tiny little words. And one of the things um, one operator was doing is he was taking a picture with his cell phone of the battery, and then he was enlarging the picture to read it. And then he'd take his phone and he'd put it back in his pocket. So not only he, he, he's, hopefully he had gloves on, but he's contaminating his phone, he's contaminating the inside of his pocket, and he's contaminating everything else that's inside of his pocket. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to talk about the different things that can come out of these batteries later. But it's definitely something you you want to protect yourself. You want to be able to sort easily. All right. Do we have any questions on types of batteries? Sarah, do you want me to go right into dangers of hazardous waste of hazardous disposal? Oh, 
Yes, um, I, I was muted too. I didn't realize I was muted. So we uh, do not see any questions specific to types of batteries at this point, but I did have an interesting comment, which we might want to address. Um, there, there are the handouts in our um, handout section. One of them is a terminal protection minimum guidelines from call to recycle. And in that, it does say that nine volt batteries do not need to be taped. And that is a rule from call to recycle. We still at DES strongly suggest that all batteries have that taping. And as we could see from the video, that nine volt batteries can cause fires. So um, call to recycle has their set of rules and then we have our set of guidelines. And those guidelines can be different um, and that's okay. But the taping of the batteries, that's where we, we wanna stick with that is, very important. Okay, so I'm going to leave that at that, and then and it's peace of mind too. We we like Tara said, we do a battery sorting exercise at DES back when we were in the building, and hopefully we'll be again someday. But right now, stored under my desk is a massive box with several hundred batteries in it of all different kinds, and they are all taped because if I see on the news that my building burned down, I know it's not going to be my fault. And same thing happens if you get a call in your facility and there's a fire, God forbid. Uh, you want to know, hey, I didn't have anything to do with that. You don't want to be the one that cost your taxpayers millions of dollars. Moving right along, <laughs> dangers and hazards. So, <clears throat> battery fires happen during transport. Uh, lithium batteries are a DOT hazmat. They have actually caught on fire on the way to the store, still in packaging. <clears throat> so, think about that when you're handling them as a waste. Uh, this slide's a little graphic. I apologize, but I really want to drive home the dangers. Uh, again, a lot of these are phones or batteries that are manufactured on the cheap. They, they don't have the same standards we have. Uh, this is a phone that exploded and actually killed a teenage girl. And on the right is a classic photo of phones just bursting into flames because of the pressure changes. They go up and down in the airplanes. Take these things very seriously. This is a little demonstration we do something similar uh, this is just a lithium battery left between two damp pieces of lunch meat over the course i think this was six hours uh, we do something similar and here's ends up being the results after a while uh, if any moisture gets inside that little grommet that separates the poles you're going to have a reaction with the lithium you probably won't get this reaction with like zinc oxide and things like that but the lithium tends to heat up when it react when it uh, hits water it reacts and releases a lot of heat I think this is the one we did at DES. So think about a child ingesting one of these things. Uh, stomach acid is gonna break down that little separate, that little grommet that separates the poles, fluid gets in, it's going to react, it's going to release heat. Uh, it typically, let's see, they actually did a study here. Here it is right here. So usually within two hours, uh, these batteries are breaking down and releasing heat. So think of that, that stomach, lining or the intestinal lining releases your stomach content spills out into the abdominal cavity and you're going into system shock multi-organ system failure these things are dangerous for children they're dangerous for you too let's talk about another hazard that people don't think about when they're storing massive amounts of batteries and that is off gassing uh, batteries give off vapors they they do this naturally they're designed to do that if you have all of the same kind of battery Great, but if you have a bunch of different batteries, unknown chemistries, all mixing gases in one spot, you want that spot to be well ventilated. You don't want to be leaning over this and breathing it day after day. Uh, if you store all your batteries in a room, I hope it has some sort of ventilation. So <clears throat> they're designed to release gases. They can build up in confined spaces. Uh, here's a nice sorting area. This is really good. So we want to talk about that we want the batteries protected from weather. I've seen sorting stations that are outside under the blue sky inside of a big sheet galvanized sheet metal tray with water inside of it. We don't wanna see that. I talked about a magnification tool. It'll really speed things along, make things go faster and it'll prevent your operators from having to take out their phone and do that little trick. And you wanna deal with leaking batteries ahead of time. And what I mean by that is if you see a battery that's leaking, you don't wanna throw it in and say, oh, they'll deal with it later because that can affect the batteries that are in there also. Have a plan for that, have a spill kit, have something to contain those batteries. And you wanna have a good supply of bags or tape. 
hand tape. This is a really good sorting station. You can see they have the three drawers, one for alkaline, one for rechargeables, and one to separate the lithium. They're not labeled. I'm assuming that's what they are. Maybe not. But either way, it's a good system that can be used if, uh, if applied properly. And of course, PPE, or as I say, the three Ps, right? Glove, gloves, glasses, and gases. Uh, you probably won't need to look like this going into your sorting area, but it is something to think about. Uh, batteries give off CO2, methane, ethane, and ethylene. All of these are hazardous according to their MSD uh, sheets. Hence the PPE, like I said, unless you're working in a confined space, you probably won't need the respirator. And I think the headphones are because her boss is going to yell at her because she doesn't have her eye protection on. Right. Transfer station fires. If you don't make it easy for your residents to collect these batteries, you're going to get them anyway. You're just going to get them in a different type of packaging. You're going to get them in your solid waste. Don't let this be your fault. If somebody does bring you a battery, don't say, hey, just I'll throw it away. It doesn't matter. Uh, don't be the one who stores a bunch of batteries that are not taped. Don't leave them out in the rain. So let's talk about taping and bagging. This is what it should look like for the most part. All of them separated. My one case of heartburn is with this bag of button cells. Again, 99% of the time, nothing happens until it does. And then it becomes a serious issue. Uh, this is not the way we want to see them taped. The poles are touching. You're just basically creating a larger battery that way. What you can do is you can lay them all down on a strip of tape and then put another piece of tape over them and you create what we call the button cell ravioli. And you can, you've can you got a whole strip of batteries that you can just put right into the recycling or the universal waste bucket. So what are our options to do with these batteries? One, you can ship them off to a certified vendor. And that's what Sean is here for to tell you a little bit about. You can take if they contain mercury or again, they're sorted as universal waste. If uh, the universal waste contract covers non-mercury batteries, you can use that. Right now it only covers mercury containing batteries. And you can research some other options and refuse them. But be aware if you do refuse them, if you don't have an option, you don't tell your residents, we can't take them, but here's where you can, you're going to get them again, or they're gonna end up in a dumpster somewhere. So what are the things you can do? Have handouts, tell them when the next has waste collection is, tell them where they can take these batteries, tell them when you can take these batteries. You can put up signage to talk about the collection area. You can put links onto your webpage. This is a really good one because it immediately gives them the next option and you don't have to hand them anything. People come up, what do I do with my batteries? Well, I can't take them right now, but if you go to our webpage, there's a link that has a bunch of different options for you. And the last one, any drop-off places, try to keep them local. People aren't gonna drive 30 miles to get rid of a battery. If you live in the Southern or the Southeast part of the state, this is a great resource, batteries and bulbs. They will take most batteries. Uh, I don't know exactly what their limits are. I, I do need to go in and visit them and find out what they don't take. Sounds like a weekend project. And then of course, there are private companies. Uh, you'll recognize this one will be talked about later. Uh, call to recycle that's the one we use in the building so i put them up here but you don't have to use them uh, great feature they have is you can go onto their web page and you can type in uh, a starting location a zip code and it will and you can set a range and it'll show you all the boxes that are in that area that you can use not all of them are open to the public you would have to call and see but this is a great resource if you're not collecting batteries or if you can't take them at the moment again Taping batteries, very important. And people always say, yeah, Dean, it gets really cold in New Hampshire. Batteries, you know, the tape doesn't stick. I did find this, it's called Frost King. It's a weather seal tape. It's adhesive, still works up to 10 below zero. If it hits 11 below, you have my permission to stop collecting batteries. And remember, if it's rechargeable, it is recyclable. You just have to find the right vendor. So final thoughts. Prepare, prepare a good sorting area, have your safety equipment at hand, have those spill kits ready. Add links to your webpage to make it easier for your residents, even if they just know how to bring their batteries in. If you get a lot of calls, hey, what do I do with my batteries? Oh, go to our webpage, we have a whole sheet on it. It saves you time on the phone, doesn't tie up your operators. That goes right along with educating your residents.
Uh, you can also reach out to schools. If you have any type of town events, my town has a harvest festival in the fall and a strawberry festival in the spring. Great time to set up a booth and talk about battery education. Have options for your residents. Don't just make them walk out without anything because they're gonna take the easiest option every time. Uh, create an image library. If you come across something really weird or something devastating or something really amazing, take a picture of it, uh, share it with your employees, make an educational slideshow, and of course, share it with us. Don't be a stranger to DES. Uh, we have we have an image library of all the things our inspectors find, and they're always these bad things. And we realized a few years ago that we don't have any pictures of the good things. Nobody's taking pictures of, of those. So if you come across something good that you did, or like I said, something really rare, we Tara or I, we would love to have that photo. And again, makes a great educational program for your operators. Any questions on the dangers and hazards of batteries? I do not have any, but we'll give people a second. I um, usually, when Dean talks about the, the ravioli or lasagna batteries, I will show this. And I am, was in my office jumping around trying to find it and realized it was behind my laptop. So, huh. so this is a piece of clear packing tape and multiple batteries just taped in there. So that's this is how you want to save your button cell batteries. You don't want to have them set up in a bag all loose jumbling around. Um, and then also I did ask when we set, set up this class for if anyone had any weird batteries that they received to send them to me. So I have one picture that I'm going to share with Sean and Dean right before the break that was sent to me. Um, and we'll discuss that. I am springing this on them. All right. So with that, I don't see any questions. Um, Sean, if you could hop on, I will pass the baton to you. Dean, thank you very much. All right. You're welcome. So Sean, as soon as your presentation comes up, I will let you know and then go silent. Here we go. How's that? Perfect. We got it. All right, I'm going mute and turn it off. Again. Great. Well, thanks everybody. I appreciate being here. Uh, my name is Sean Plass and I'm the Northeast Regional Program Manager for Call to Recycle. Um, I live in Burlington, Vermont, so I'm right next door. I'm always excited to be part of this because I feel um, New Hampshire's got a great educational program compared to the most of the states that I work in. I work in uh, Vermont, but my organization Call to Recycle is out of Atlanta, Georgia, and I manage the territory from Vermont down to Washington, D.C., and I just think that the uh, education training system you've got going on in New Hampshire is fantastic. So today I'm going to talk about managing batteries and um, I want to start off with what I call battery awareness and I'll start with a quick story. So I got a call recently from um, the compliance director of one of the largest telecom um, companies in the whole country. They have hundreds of thousands of employees and with COVID-19 all these employees were working at home and most of them had laptop batteries. And when they had worked in the office place, office um, office space, if they had an issue with their laptop battery, they could just walk the laptop down to the IT department, drop it off, and the battery would be replaced, serviced, or what have you. But because everybody was at home, um, what do you do? So a number of these employees were having swollen laptop batteries, and these are lithium-ion batteries, which have the, the potential to combust. They're all at home, and there's certain DOT regulations on whether these batteries can be shipped and what to do with them. So the compliance director asked me a question. She said, can I have my employees take apart their laptops and remove um, these swollen batteries? And I said, I really would not recommend that. This is a short video, there's no audio, um, but this is a laptop battery with a thumbtack being stuck into it, a single thumbtack, and this is what happens. That is a lithium fire that's about 700 degrees. <clears throat> it burns for a long time. So you can imagine one of these uh, company's employees taking apart their laptop and puncturing the battery with a screwdriver and it bursting the flames uh, could severely injure somebody. Here's another example. Um, this is a FedEx truck in Ohio that was carrying batteries for us and the batteries did not have proper terminal protection. So the lithium batteries contacted each other, caught on fire 
and this is the result. The whole FedEx truck was destroyed. Luckily, the driver got out safe. There were no other car accidents around, but you can see the fire trucks are there. This is on a major highway in Ohio. Wake up call for our organization to really become stricter on training and so forth, because um, we are primarily concerned with safety. That's our main objective. Here's another example. Uh, this is Tioga County, New York, last January. This was a recycling center. Uh, there was a huge fire, destroyed the whole recycling center. They attributed it to a cell phone. One of the questions that we have is, are these fires being overreported? Are they being underreported? Some people say that they're overreported, that um, everything is blamed on batteries now, that kind of any fire that happens in a facility, they just automatically say that it was a battery issue. But there's another argument. Some people say that they're underreported, that um, people don't want their insurance costs to go up and so forth. So the way they do, they do have battery fires, they really don't report it very often. They try and um, not publicize it because they don't want their insurance costs to go up and, and other issues at their site. We don't know, but what we care about is the safety. Number one, we care about your safety at your site, all the people who work there. We just want people to be safe. Uh, number two is the cost of rebuilding these facilities, especially for small towns and so forth, is really exorbitant. It's hard to do. And even if you do rebuild the facility, the insurance costs go up enormously once you've had a major fire. So it's something we take importantly, and I, I'm glad to see that New Hampshire takes it importantly, and I really want everybody um, to, to think about it deeply from your own facility standpoint on how to protect it, how to keep it safe for the future. So quick retouch on um, the batteries. So just to break it down really simply, there's two battery types. There's primary, which means one and done. You use it once, you toss it. Then there's rechargeable, which means you use it more than once, you keep recharging it. And you can remember it by the Latin roots, prime means one, then re repeat for recharge, repeat. So really simple. Prime means one, primary batteries, rechargeable means you use it more than once. Another type of battery to be familiar with is called a DDR battery. This is damage defective recalled lithium battery. So when a lithium battery is damaged, say it's cracked or swollen or it's leaking, or it's defective, that something happened during manufacturing, or it's been recalled by the manufacturer, it's classified as a DDR battery by Department of Transportation. So this is a transportation issue. One of these batteries can't just be put in a truck and moved like another material. So just to clarify, there's kind of two different terminologies we're looking at here. The first is hazardous waste, the second is a hazardous material. So the EPA would determine what a hazardous waste is. For example, a NICAD battery, nickel cadmium battery, is a hazardous waste. That nickel cadmium, you don't really want that in landfills. It's toxic. You don't want it in drinking water. So the EPA will say that some batteries are hazardous waste. The DOT, on the other hand, Department of Transportation, will determine if it's a hazardous material. So a lithium damaged lithium battery is a hazardous material because it's not safe to transport. So you need either CFR 49 training, like certification, or you need a special container with a special permit and so forth to do it. So that's just something for you to keep in mind. These DDR batteries, you're going to start to see a lot of them as more lithium batteries are put into more and more products. So anytime you come across a damaged lithium battery, be very aware of it and follow the DOT code. So let's talk about what's really going on in the world of batteries, because I live in that space. I talk to robot companies and drone companies and stuff. So there's a lot going on. So I'll just quickly walk you through some of the developments. This is a graph, a chart from The Economist in 2016. And I like it because it was predicting the growth of lithium batteries. And it all came true. So on the left side, this is your major battery manufacturers. You've got Panasonic, you've probably heard of, LG, Samsung, you know, major companies. And this was the prediction that they were going to grow their battery manufacturing capacity to make lithium batteries. And all this came true in the last years. So there is massive manufacturing now available worldwide for lithium batteries. What's the result of that on the right side? The blue is the cost per kilowatt hour. So you can see the cost per kilowatt hour of a lithium battery drops dramatically since 2008. You're going from $1,000 a kilowatt hour down to about $100. So the cost has come way down for these batteries. And then this red line is really quite interesting too. This is the battery density. And this is how much, basically how much energy is there for the size of the battery. 
you can see it's gone up twofold from 200 to 400 watts per liter. So what does all this mean? It means that battery manufacturing is huge for lithium batteries now. The costs have gone way down and they're getting more and more powerful and getting smaller and smaller. So that means they're being put into everything because they're small, powerful, and cheap. You can put them into anything. Paradoxically, as they get smaller and more powerful, they're getting bigger and more powerful. So Dean showed a picture of the Tesla car battery. That's a huge battery, but really it's just hundreds of small batteries strung together. They're called 18650s. They look like a double A battery. They're really tiny and you just string hundreds of them together to make a giant battery. So as these batteries get smaller and cheaper and more powerful, you string them together to make them bigger and more powerful. So that means batteries are going into vehicles and trucks and everything else. So right now it's a dynamic market and it's all driven by lithium. So you have to be aware that there's a lot of batteries coming towards you and devices. What's also driving it is called the Internet of Things. These are devices that are connected to the Internet. OK, so right now there's 10 billion of these devices on Earth. Um, you know, you've got your phones, your laptops, your iPads and so forth. All those are connected to the Internet. 10 billion of them in 2020. As of 2025, there will be 62 billion. So you're looking at a 500 percent increase in the next five years well, four years now. Correspondingly, there'll be a 400% increase in lithium manufacturing capacity. So you're gonna just see a deluge of devices headed your way, all with lithium batteries in them. And all these devices are gonna have to be uh, processed at a waste facility, recycling facility, and those batteries have the pot potential to catch on fire. So this is something you really have to be aware of because it's gonna increase 500% in the next few years. One example is this drone. Verizon predicts they'll have a million of these drones on the 5G cellular network in the next year or two. What, it, what does that mean? You can have one of these drones at your wedding and live stream a video of your wedding to your grandmother who's in a nursing home in California, and she'll be able to watch that wedding real time, live speed from a drone through the 5G network. So these are gonna become commonplace throughout the world. What's also driving this is COVID. Um, COVID has accelerated the internet of things. For example, in education, oops. In education, how many of our kids now are at home on laptops being educated at home? So they've got their own devices now. Um, agriculture, uh, because people didn't want people on farms having contact with each other. A lot of farmers are now using drones to survey the land instead of having people walk around. You've got robots in smart city doing police work, driving around, um, riots and so forth. So it's really unbelievable how batteries and robots and devices are getting into every area of society. And it's just accelerating with COVID. So let me walk you quickly through a day in the life. These are devices that are all available now. These aren't future devices. This is something you can buy right now online if you want to. And let's start by imagining that you can travel again. You've been vaccinated and you're flying back to an airport in New Hampshire and it's a hot day and you don't wanna carry your suitcase. This is a suitcase that's a robot and it follows you wherever you go. It follows your phone, it's tethered to your phone, it's a smart device, it's got lithium batteries and it will walk through the airport, go around corners and follow you wherever you walk. So you leave the airport, you're driving home, you decide to check on your dog, your dog's got a collar that transmits to your phone, you realize your dog's in your neighbor's yard digging up the garden. So you pull your car over, get out, grab your dog, put him in the car, and then drive home. Your teenager's shooting hoops in the driveway when you pull in the driveway, and she's got a basketball with a battery in it. And that battery uh, transmits to the phone a signal that tracks how many times she dribbles, how many times she shoots, how many steps and miles she goes, and plots her whole workout. So you say hi to your teenager, and then you look around your yard, you realize the lawn has been mowed. So you send your little robot out, this robot, um, coordinates through GPS satellites and has artificial intelligence and memorizes your lawn and it mows your lawn for you while you're inside your home. You walk into your house, you say hello to your spouse, and then um, your spouse says, I picked up some steaks, so let's have some steaks and barbecue them for dinner. But the problem is everybody in the family likes their steak cooked to a different temperature. These are four thermometers. They have lithium batteries in them. You stick them in, it syncs to your phone, lets you know when each person's steak is done. Rare, medium, well, well done, tracks it for you. While you're cooking your steak, um, your phone buzzes and your baby needs to be changed. 
This is a diaper with a battery in it and a sensor that has a moisture sensor, and it lets you know when your baby has wet itself, soiled itself, needs to be changed. It lets you know if your baby's awake. It has a movement sensor and it sends you an image to your phone through this camera. So we used to worry about diapers um, having to be recycled because of the waste they created. Now we have to worry about them catching on fire when they're thrown into a waste facility. So when I say the Internet of Things, connecting everything in your life to the internet and all powered by batteries, this is what I'm talking about. It's literally your child's diaper connected to the internet, connected to your phone. So all this can kind of seem dramatic and whatnot, um, but there's a lot of good coming from batteries. So in 2019, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry went to three, these three gentlemen, and here's what the Nobel Prize um, said. These three gentlemen had created the lithium ion battery, and this is what the prize committee said. They have laid the foundation of a wireless, fossil fuel-free society and are of the greatest benefit to mankind. So let's break that down into two parts. Wireless society, that's the internet of things we just talked about. If that's all that lithium batteries had invented, that alone would be worthy of a Nobel Prize. But the second part, fossil fuel-free society, is really important. Renewable energy is coming at us so quickly. I know I used to work in solar, I work for Tesla, I've, I've seen the electric vehicles coming, the electric e-bikes, the solar panels tied to batteries in your home. The renewable energy, this fossil fuel free society is gonna be lithium's next phase. And that's something you have to be aware of as it starts to end up in your facility. Here's an example. I live in Burlington, Vermont. This is a Vermont company, it's called Beta Technologies. They designed the first electric airplane from scratch where every single part of this airplane was designed from scratch. It's a team of geniuses, these scientists working on this day and night. The point of it is for organ transplants. So this takes off vertically like a helicopter. It flies horizontal, horizontally at high speeds for hundreds of miles, then it lands vertically again. So it goes from a hospital roof to hospital roof in a short amount of time, and then it recharges electric, electrically. So it's all can run on clean energy if the grid is clean. UPS just bought 150 of these planes last week and they're planning another 150 more for getting critical packages a short distance when you need it in a nice clean energy way. So this is the future. Planes, trains, automobiles, all of it powered by electricity, all of it powered by lithium batteries. So let's just discuss who we are. Now we kind of looked at batteries, we've talked about some of the safety issues. Uh, let me let me tell you who we are at Call to Recycle and this chart kind of explains it. So we're the country's largest, most recycle, most reliable battery recycling program. We're funded by 300 battery producing stewards. So let's let's walk around this chart. There's 300 manufacturers and stewards that fund us. So take Panasonic, Black & Decker, um, Energizer. So major battery manufacturers they pay us dues every quarter based on how many batteries they sell into the marketplace. So they track how many batteries go into the US, then they pay us you know, fractions of a penny per battery, and then we collect all those dues. We use those dues to educate consumers, to teach them that batteries can be recyclable. We then run 16,000 collection sites around the country that we send boxes to, our patented boxes. We send these boxes, hundreds of thousands of boxes a year to collection sites. So some of the places are Lowe's, Staples, Home Depot, a lot of municipal sites. There's a lot of hardware stores like Ace and True Value and smaller small town hardware stores. So we've got 16,000 collection sites that we send boxes to and then the consumers bring the batteries to those sites and collect them. Those batteries then get shipped the, the boxes are, are pre-labeled for shipping and permitted by DOT for transporting batteries. So, so they get shipped to battery sorters. So the battery sorters collect the boxes, they open them up, they sort all the batteries by chemistry. So there's lithium, lead, um, alkaline and so forth. They sort them by chemistry and then they weigh those and then that gets tracked barcode scanned. So I can tell you exactly how many pounds of lithium batteries came from the Staples store in Williston, Vermont last month. So we track it all. The sorters then package the batteries by chemistry type and send them to processors. Each processor typically specializes in one or two types of batteries. So there'll be a lithium battery processor, there'll be a lead battery processor. They're gonna take those batteries and either grind them up mechanically or dissolve them using acids, which is called hydrometallurgy, or they're gonna melt them, which, 
um, which is called pyrometallurgy. And they're basically going to extract the elemental metals out of these batteries, purify them, and then sell them back in the metals marketplace. So other companies will buy these metals and turn them into new batteries, like lead is typically turned into new lead batteries. Some of it turns into steel pots and pans. Some stuff like zinc actually goes into sunscreen and fertilizer. And then so these get turned into new products in new manufacturing. So this is what we call the circular economy, where we're taking a product, collecting it, recycling it, and turning it into something else. And it's something we're really proud of. We did over 8 million pounds of batteries last year, and um, all that gets turned back into new products. So a little bit about our program. It's a free program for municipalities to recycle rechargeable batteries. So if you've got a site in New Hampshire, it's free. We'll send you the box for free. The shipping is free. The recycling is free. Your cost, your challenge is just the labor to package the batteries properly and then ship them. But everything is included, all the permits, everything you need is done for you. So we really um, want you to do it. We're here to help. We're here to make it easy and simple for you as possible. It improves the fire safety for your facility. Like if customers, the, the main reason people don't recycle batteries is because they don't know what to do them do with them and it's inconvenient. So if you put it on your website that you will accept batteries and you may have a sign that when people pull in, they can see where to drop them off and you make it so simple for them, they will do it. Um, and we can provide you with posters and um, signage and that kind of stuff that, that will help you make that marketing mission. And we can give you graphics for your social media, for your website. So really um, think about how to build a battery program. It's, it's gonna improve the fire safety of your site because if people aren't throwing them in the trash, or the recycling bins, the blue bins, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be much safer for you. And it's also environmentally friendly, of course, too. We'll also do non-rechargeable batteries. That's not free. That's a fee-based service. So if you want to do alkaline batteries or lithium primary batteries, we would charge for that based on the pounds. But it can go right into our boxes, too. Um, it's not something we do because we don't have many primary battery stewards, but we can do it um, at cost. So let's quickly look at what battery recycling means. These are the boxes we send out. They have a pop-up display, which makes it into like a mailbox for putting it on, say, a hardware store countertop. This is a patented liner that we have a patent on made out of recycled plastic. Uh, it comes with these plastic baggies for putting lithium batteries and other batteries that need terminal protection into. There's about 50 bags per box. And it folds up really neat, seals itself, and it's got all the labeling and permitting on it and uh, shipping labels and stuff for shipping. So we send these boxes to you for free for rechargeable batteries. You fill them up, takes about, hold 66 pounds. You typically fill them to 50 pounds. You seal it, UPS, FedEx, they take it away, and then we recycle it for you. This is what it looks like when there's a lithium fire inside. We've never had a fire breach our, our boxes, knock on wood. Um, the, the patent on these is uh, for up to 1,100 degrees. And lithium fires around 700 degrees, so we've got a buffer in there. Um, but this is what it looks like when we have a fire. If we get a fire like this, we'll barcode scan it. We'll see um, where it came from. We'll call that site. We'll retrain them, make sure that they're packing the batteries properly. Um, but we're very proud of this box. It's been working great for us. These are the rechargeable batteries that are free. Nickel cadmium, lithium ion, nickel metal hydride, small sealed lead acid, nickel zinc. A lot of these you're going to be familiar with from laptops and tools and so forth. Small sealed lead acid are typically in like exit signs in hotels. So when the power goes out, the signs still light up. Um, but the one that's growing the most here is lithium ion. These are the ones that people are concerned about, like drill batteries and so forth. If they get crushed by a bulldozer at your facility, you know, chances are they're going to catch on fire. These are the non-rechargeable batteries. These are fee-based, so we would charge to have these recycled. Alkaline, you're all familiar with these. These make up about 80% of the batteries that are sold in the country. And then these are a little bit newer. These are lithium primary. These are dangerous too. Uh, we, they're significantly less dangerous than the rechargeable lithium batteries, but lithium primary batteries, same thing. If you drove over a build, bulldozer with one of these, chances are it would combust. This is our guidelines. As Tara said before, um, it sounds like you've got stricter guidelines in New Hampshire, so I think that's what you should abide by. Ours are probably less restrictive. We're really going by DOT code. Um, but to quickly walk you through it, each lithium battery, well, here are the batteries that need terminal protection. It means they need to be individually bagged or taped. So either of your lithiums, 
lithium button cells, coin cells, your lithium bat primary batteries, or your lithium ion batteries, those all need terminal protection. Yes, it's required. So each one of those have to be individually bagged or taped. They cannot have contact with any other batteries or materials when they're transported. Same with lead, small seal lead acid. Those are those exit sign batteries I was talking about also need terminal protection. So lithium, whether it's rechargeable or primary, bagged and taped, lead acid, bagged and taped. On the other side, alkaline batteries, the primary alkaline batteries, if they're greater than 12 volts, they need to be taped because that's getting to be a pretty big battery. They're not very common, um, but if you had a huge uh, uh, alkaline battery, you would need to terminally protect it. Anything smaller does not. And then when you look at your nickel batteries, nickel cadmium, metal hydride, and zinc, uh, when it gets above nine volts, yes, it's required to be protected. Again, not as common, um, but definitely needs protection. And this is the graphic that Tara talked about um, is uploaded for you to download today. So it should be there in your links. Uh, also, don't put anything in the boxes, you know, anything that can combust, you don't want paper bags, masking tape, blue tape, scotch tape, and that kind of stuff. Don't put those in the boxes because they could uh, catch on fire under transport. Dean showed you this. This is the ravioli, the pasta. Lay down a strip of packing tape, put out your coin cells, another strip on top, keeps them all from touching, and then you can put that right in our box. I talked about DDR batteries. Those are the damaged, defective recall lithium batteries. When they're damaged, you can't transport them unless you are using fully regulated procedures with CFR 49 training and certification, or you get one of our DDR kits or another DDR kit. Um, we would ship this to you. You drop the battery in, you fill it with this material called cell block, which I'll get to. You seal it, and then UPS, FedEx it. All the labeling you need is right on this. Uh, so it's easy. None of that CFR 49 paperwork. You can buy these off of our web store. Super easy, but this is how you deal with DDR batteries at your site. If you are a large site and you're getting a ton of DDR batteries, cheaper way to do it is do it in bulk. This holds up to 132 pounds of batteries compared to this one, which holds five pounds of batteries. So you can get 132 pounds of DDR batteries under our special permit 20549. This is something that you're gonna really need to be aware of because it hasn't quite reached the recycling facilities, the waste facilities but it's out there in the in the marketplace. So this is called a high watt hour battery. So when a battery gets above, a lithium battery gets above 300 watt hours, it's a hazardous material. You can't just ship that normally, whether it's damaged or not. So what is a high watt hour battery? It's simple. The battery will say the volts on it. So you take 80 volts, see this battery lawnmower battery says 80 volts. You multiply it by the amp hours, 40 amp hours. It'll say amp hours on the side. That gives you 320 watt hours. So it's volt times amp hours gives you watt hours. If it's over 300, proceed with caution. This is a extremely powerful battery that DOT says you need to use ship fully regulated. We have this box now, which is a high watt hour box that you can drop e-bike batteries and lawnmower batteries and so forth into it and then ship it. It's permitted by Department of Transportation. We are shipping robot batteries all over the country and e-bike batteries. And then the major carriers shut it down because they got nervous. So now we're reapplying and just basically working with their executives to educate them. So this should be back up and running. We are negotiating right now with all the type, top e-bike manufacturers in the country to set up a nationwide e-bike stewardship program. And most of the top um, tool manufacturers to set up a nationwide uh, tool battery program. So we're working to set up stewardship programs for these, but right now we don't have that. So these may start showing up in your facilities, proceed with caution. They're very big. Uh, they got a lot of power. If they went off, um, it could be a, a rough scene. So let's look at how to protect your facilities and your staff. A lithium fire, um, is really kind of the same as most fires. You've got heat, that's uh, called thermal propagation. Lithium burns so hot that if you have one little battery, it will move to the next battery, to the next cell, the next cell, the next cell, and pretty soon all the cells in the tool battery will be on fire. So that's called thermal propagation, and it's tough to stop with lithium. The thing that's burning is the fuel, that's the lithium electrolyte. That's what actually catches on fire in the battery, and that's combining with the oxygen in the air. Um, to accelerate that fire. 
and as it burns, it releases a lot of toxic gases, which you don't want to inhale. So this is our challenge with lithium heat, fuel, oxygen, and gas. The solution we have, uh, we teamed up with a company out of Maine called Cellblock, which had a really incredible, innovative product. It's made out of recycled glass. And when it's manufactured, these little glass BBs are infused with microscopic air bubbles, which makes this really light granule. It looks like a little BB. It's white. Um, it's full of these bubbles. And what that does is lowers the melting point. So when these BBs are poured onto a fire, they melt. And when they go from a solid to a liquid, they suck the heat out of the fire. So that stops the thermal propagation. The microscopic air bubbles also absorb the fuel, the lithium electrolyte that's fueling the fire, so that cuts off the fuel source. And then as it melts, it encases the battery in glass, which cuts off the oxygen. So you've cut off heat, fuel, and oxygen, and that's why it's rated as a Class D uh, fire extinguishing agent for combustible metals, specifically for lithium ion battery fires. So this is really innovative. It's made for lithium battery fires. It's something you should have at your facilities. It's also non-toxic. In fact, it absorbs toxic gases in those microscopic air bubbles. So it's absorbing the gases. And when it's putting out the fire, it doesn't create any new chemicals because it's inert. Uh, so you're not, a, you're not inhaling those toxic gases during a lithium fire. So we're the exclusive distributors of this because we're nonprofit. We really wanted to lock it in so that we can make it affordable for the waste industry. And so far, it's been selling really great around the country. Um, something you can find on our website or just reach out to me if you want to talk about it. Here is, oh, didn't work. Well, there's a do video you, which. Uh, do you want me to try to find the link and pull it up? Um, that's OK. OK. I, I, can, I can continue. It was really just a fire. It was just an image of how that product puts out the fire. But basically, you pour those beads on, on the fire, and it just extinguishes it. Um, so those beads get, can also be put into pillows. And if you drop one of these pillows on a battery, it'll extinguish it. So you saw that sorting station that Dean had a picture of, where all those batteries were laid out on kind of a table and people were sorting them by chemistry type and so forth. This is where um, this is appropriate. Then if you had a little lithium battery that began to smolder or smoke, take one of these pads, put it on it, it'll extinguish it. You put a fire blanket over the pad, which is a bigger surface area and it contains any sparks. When it's extinguished, you pick it up with gloves and you drop it into a DDR kit and you can ship it to us to recycle. Um, so this hangs on the wall kind of like a defibrillator or a fire extinguisher. It's got bright colors so anybody can see it in an emergency. You just open it up, grab the pad, put it right on there. So if you hung it on the wall near your um, sorting station, that'd be the ideal location. We also have these drums. There's a number of facilities that are starting use to these drums to kind of separate some e-waste devices. So e-waste is often thrown into big Gaylords. And what will happen is you'll have a tablet thrown into a giant Gaylord and then someone drops a television on it, which is a terrible thing to happen because that tablet has a lithium battery in it. So now some people are starting to separate some of those devices and tablets and so forth into these cell block drums. They have a double wall in them that's filled with the cell block EX, those glass granules, which helps contain heat and so forth. The lids are vented to allow gases to escape. So you can throw devices in here and fill it up with cell block as you go. And then when you're ready to ship, take them out and ship them. Uh, some people are using these to store DDR batteries, you know, fill it up with um, cell block as you go. But it's a great storage option that if you find a lot of devices you want to separate and kind of store in a safe way until you're ready to deal with them, these cell block drums are great. They come in different sizes. Um, and you can also ship. They're pretty expensive if you can use them for shipping, but they can be reused over and over again. So this is a safe way to store lithium batteries. Uh, all this is available in our online store. Just go to calltorecycle.org and you can order boxes. You can order um, safety products and so forth or reach out to me my email's at the end of this and uh, we can get you going so last slide just want to touch quickly on strategy your facility really needs to think of batteries from a strategic standpoint and to me that means you're developing a battery program if you don't your residents are going to throw batteries in the trash and their cycling bins and they're going to get crushed they're going to go through shredders they're going to um, get impacted and they're gonna catch on fire. So you gotta really design a battery program for your facility. That means there's a budget. That means it's like, it's an agenda item in the meetings. It means there's a budget every year that's devoted to battery program. 
into doing outreach, social media, that type of stuff. You need to think about your facility layout. Where's your battery sorting station? If it's near other recyclables like paper and cardboard, probably not the best spot. Is there a way you can isolate it from chemicals and so forth? How do you lay out your facility for battery recycling? What type of training do you have? We've got an online video that we can email out to staff at different facilities and they can take that video. There's a quiz so that they're safely trained on battery recycling. Uh, safety products, do you want something for your sorting station? Do you need DDR kits? What do you need to keep your facility safe? And is there a budget every year for that product? And again, as I touched on outreach, if people, all our research shows it's simple. If people don't know what to do with batteries, and it's inconvenient, they throw them in the garbage or they throw them in recycling bins. So your website should say you recycle batteries, your signage should say that, your social media should be talking about it, newsletters, um, events, anything you can do to educate the public on taking the batteries out of the waste stream, recycling them, send them to our sites, send them to Lowe's, Home Depot, Staples, anything you can do to redirect the battery flow is really the most important thing from a safety standpoint. And what's the point of all this? It's really about future proofing. As I said before, these devices are gonna grow 500% in the next four years. We really need to prepare ourselves that batteries are one of the most important products to ever affect humanity. And they're gonna be in everything. They're gonna be so cheap. They're gonna be in every device, your baby's diapers, your watches, your cell phones, everything is gonna have a battery in it. And you need to have a plan on how to future proof your facility for that inevitable reality. This is my name, my email, send me an email. I'm a big LinkedIn guy, so connect with me on LinkedIn if you're on LinkedIn, love to connect. I love to uh, see what articles people are reading, what they're sharing, it helps me really understand what's going on in your industry. So happy to talk and answer any questions anytime. <clears throat> okay, so um, I was answering a question uh, one of the operators had asked uh, to share the link to order. So I'm, um, go ahead. If you go to calltherecycle.org and then there's a there's a tab for store, um, that's where you can purchase things. If you've got a credit card, you can do that. Or you can just call customer service, the 1-800 number, and you can order through them. They can set you up if you want them an account and be invoiced as opposed to just buying it with a credit card. I was going to say, I think um, most people are probably thinking, okay, how do I order? Who's got a shopping list going? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now is the time. If you guys have questions, we are running a little early. So if you've got questions, now will be the time to ask those. Um, feel free to put it in the question box, the chat box, um, or raise your hand if you are not sure quite how to get to the chat or the question box. Um, so I actually had a question, um, and Dean, you and Dean could answer this one, I think. Um, and it, it might be a New Hampshire thing, or it could be something we need to look into. But <clears throat> I was thinking about the DDR battery drums. So those basically are batteries that are damaged batteries. Um, but they are being handled for recycle. If they're brought into a facility and a facility is putting them in their drums, what is the, how long can they stay on site? Are they considered then hazardous waste where they've got 90 days or are they considered universal waste where they have the one year? I think it all depends on if they're damaged. If it's an intact battery, it can be accumulated for up to one year under the universal waste rule. But if it's damaged, it's managed as hazardous waste. So you have a maximum of 90 days on site. Okay, so that's what I thought. So for those, if you're going to be, if you do have the DDR batteries, which all of you in some time in your lifetime working at the transfer station will end up with a DDR battery, um, you've got 90 days to get it off site. So that's something you want to think about. And if you have those, um, those 55 gallon drums and those and you have that for DDR batteries, you need to think that's got to go in 90 days. But if you're using it, as Sean had suggested, as just something to collect those batteries in case there is a fire, then they don't have to go in, the, in that time. So this is where you really need to start thinking about your facility and knowing your facility and your residents and what they're bringing in um, and being prepared for pretty much anything. Um, and then, so I'm not seeing any questions, but I've got a couple, so I'm just going to keep going. Uh, one of the issues that, and this is going to be a, 
oh, how do you can't get there from here type of question. One of the issues that many of our transfer stations are having is managing their glass and getting rid of their glass. And there, there are slowly um, more PGA sites coming up. So process glass aggregate for road base and that type of thing. You, Sean, you mentioned that company, the cell block, they actually recycle glass. Are they looking for partners um, to, to collect glass or how do they get their glass? How, how does that work? Um, because I'm thinking if we may have to talk with NRRA about this to, to make it lucrative for everybody, but if they could have a pathway to as much glass as they want and need, and then they can make that cell block. They're in Maine, so New Hampshire's not that far away. They can make that cell block and then that could go to the, be used for the entire country, you know? So it's, well, it's, it's looking? interesting. They, right now it's, it's made in the Ukraine and shipped over here, but they are planning to build their own facility. Um, so I will probably hit you up um, on that recommendation when that time comes, but that is their plan. They've grown uh, by leaps and bounds in the last yeah. year or two. Um, so they see the financial benefits and the environmental benefits of making it here. Plus you don't have to ship it, you know, on shipping containers and so forth. So that's their goal. So definitely um, I think it's in, in the pipeline. I just don't know when or where they're going to do it. Okay. But I think it would be in the Northeast. I think it would be some somewhere in the Northeast that they're they're planning it, probably in All Maine. Right. All right. So you guys who are on here, you heard it first. You may have an avenue for your glass. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> All right. So we do have um, a company, a uh, question. Um, small municipality, they use the boxes to ship. What smaller size containers could they use for swollen batteries? DDR batteries. Um, the drum is not realistic. Yep. So you guys have that small. Do you want me to give you back the screen, Sean, so you can show it? Let me uh, see if I can. Yeah. Okay. Let me just pull up our site here. All right. Let me know when you're ready and I'll hit share. Okay. Right. Are you looking at our website now? Oh, you now, you now we are, yeah. So we've got two sizes. This is the bigger one, and then this is called medium. We used to have a small one, which was like a smaller paint can, um, but this is the smallest that we have now for, for lithium. This one's 150, it's like a five gallon. This is a smaller one for $80. Um, and it's a little bit slow because I'm on the uh, video, yeah. but, but it holds four pounds of batteries. So, so you can put four pounds of batteries in there plus the glass. So what's the heaviest that that container can be? Wasn't there a weight? I remember when these first came out, there was a weight. Um, no, yeah. It's, it's rated on the amount of batteries you can hold. So right okay. here it says 4.4 4. 4 pounds of lithium ion batteries. And okay. then you just fill the glass till it's full. Fill yep. it with the pellets. And this is something that won't go bad. I remember when NRRA first started showing us these. This does not go bad. So you can buy it now for your facility and just have it there so you're ready. Um, this is That's a, what this we is recommend, yeah. yeah. From a safety standpoint, if you are sorting batteries and you see a swollen or cracked battery, you don't want to have to order and wait a few days for this to arrive. Like ideally you have one right beside the sorting station. You drop the battery in, fill it up, get it out of there. Um, because you just don't want to have a swollen battery lying around your facility for very long. Right. We do have a, a new product, which is envelopes. Um, these are really for manufacturers for sending laptops around. When I talked about that um, telecommunications company at the beginning that had all those COVID employees, this is what we sold them. They bought all these, um, we send these directly to their employees. They drop their laptop in here with a swollen battery and then ship it back to their IT departments. Um, so this is all permitted by DOT. It's expensive and it only holds a small amount, but that's another option. Okay. I saw a hand go up, but then I think it went back down. <laughs> um, yep, it must've gone back down. That's okay. Um, so if there are no more 
questions that are hopping through. I'm going to take the screen back. I'm going to, I have a couple of poll questions to throw out to people. If you want to ask, if you think of something, you can ask, oh, um, we did get a question. How much are the envelopes? They're $95. Okay. All right. Okay. So I've got my screen back, I think. Yes. Yes. One of the things in the handout section is this poster, which you guys can see. It says, take charge of your batteries. We are working on a uh, campaign for batteries for you guys. It is taking a little bit longer than we originally thought, but we'll say due to a number of factors. Uh, but this poster is online right now. It is readily and available for you guys. You can print it. Um, we are looking to secure funding to have these printed for facilities. But basically, it's for your residents and your customers. When they are walking to throw away their trash, throw away their recyclables, put their scrap metal into the scrap metal containers, we, we want them to stop. Think about it. Do you have any batteries? Do you have? Do you think you might have batteries? What types of batteries? And then where do they get rid of them? Um, it's a pretty simple, you know, stop, take a second, think about what you're doing and why. Um, and it's meant to open up a conversation for you guys to have with your residents and your customers. This is online. It's also available in the handout section um, of your toolbar. Uh, and then if you guys have questions, you can email me, you can email Dean, and we can get these to you. And then as more um, things come out, we will get them to you. We also suggest you put these on your website. And then there is a video um, that will be coming as well. So that is that. And let me throw out these couple of polls. All right. So this one is choose, choose all that applies. What types of batteries do you collect for recycling at your facility? This is just to kind of gauge for those of you who are on the call what you're collecting. Oh, it's a dead heat. So Sean, I got the question, does the battery container hold more than one DDR battery? And I think that depends on the, the one that they choose, right? Yep, um, so the, the large one can hold up to 11 pounds DDR batteries, and then the smaller one is 4.4 .4 pounds, so you can have multiple batteries in that. Mm -hmm. And they still, so if they're damaged, do they still wanna tape them? Um, yes, I would, pr I would still do terminal protection and then just put the glass granules around it. Okay. But just, That's what I was just for, I, I'm always like super cautious. <laughs> yes. All right. So I'm going to share this one so you guys can see what everybody's collecting. So 58% of you are collecting alkaline batteries, 58% button cells, 69% lithium batteries, and 81% lead acid. Lead acid batteries I knew would be our highest. Um, and then there are some others. So does anyone want to type what the others that they are collecting? You can put them in the chat that, or the question. That's great. That's a high percentage of alkaline. Yeah, that is high for alkaline. I was shocked. All right, while y'all are typing the different kinds, I'm going to send this one out. When batteries are sorted at your facility, are they, the ends are taped. Oh, that's a weird, I wrote that weirdly, typed it weirdly. And then these questions we do, we are collecting who is typing what. So if there are, if you guys have questions or if um, you want to discuss the answers at your facility and why it is you do things, we can talk about those uh, after the class and go through those. Or if you want more information, please feel free to email me. All right, I'm going to share that one. So 65% say yes, yay, that's a huge number, thank you. 19% uh, say no, that's okay. Um, and then we do not sort batteries, they're collected in one container. I'm hoping, I don't know how that works. Um, and then batteries are prohibited at the facility. 
So those that don't sort the batteries, hopefully this class will make you want to tape them. Ah, the, the bags. Okay, so someone said taped or put in bags. I should have added the bags. Sorry about that. Um, good point. Yes, bagged or taping. All right. When we sort batteries, the PPE we use is good. I'm getting. Getting low numbers where I want low numbers. <laughs> you guys, a few more seconds. So with this one, we're getting 4%. Don't wear any PPE. I'm hoping after this class, you all wear it. Um, I'm really happy to see goggles and gloves um, are being worn. That is great. And then the 26%, this does not apply as we don't sort the batteries. Hopefully, um, you guys will start sorting the batteries or have someone who, or have the resident sort as they're supposed to. Um, and get with the program there. If you have any questions, again, give us a call. All right, I think I've got one more. Hmm. Okay. In the last five years, has your facility has an incident due to batteries such as a fire or spill? So this is, we're gonna go with, it was assumed it was a battery a fire, or you were told it was a battery fire. Holy cow, people voted quick. 20 seconds and we were at 85%. All right, so I'm gonna share that. So 89% said no, that's awesome. That's really good that that number is there, but we've got that 11%. There have been quite a few fires that we have seen in New Hampshire uh, just in the last year, we're seeing more and more homeowners cleaning out, and they do not know how to handle their batteries. We're learning that. So we are trying to get the information to you so you can then pass it on to them. And that's another reason why we have this class. And uh, really talking to your residents when they're coming in and having those conversations. You guys are armed with your best management practices. Those are not for you to just hang on to. You can share those if you'd like. Uh, you can make your own signage. You can take this signage that we that we have here, the, the poster, and go from there. Um, we want you guys to definitely feel empowered to have those conversations with both your customers, your residents, and then also to your leadership. Uh, if you want to share this class with your boards of selectmen um, or your boss, your next step up, please have the, the, even if it's just portions of the class, really, you need to watch this. Um, Sean, at Call to Recycle, I don't know how many years ago, maybe two years ago, um, they said that in order for people to be uh, a customer of call to recycle, they had to take the 20 minute training. Is that still the case? One person at each collection site has to be trained, um, okay. but we can train as many as you want. Yeah. So I would strongly suggest if you've, even if you're trained or your supervisor is trained, that you take the call to recycle training, that you have your, the, the new people take the training, and that does count towards continuing professional development for SWAT. And then if you make any changes at your facility, you need to talk about those changes and then implement them. That'll all count. It is in, in, in situ training that counts towards your hours. So don't think of it as, oh, just one more thing to do. Think of it as your safety, and it's really important. Um, so I'm thinking that is the last poll question I have for this first half of the training. Uh, does anybody have any questions before we take a 15-minute break? Uh, 
I'm not seeing any chat. I'm not seeing any hands raised. No questions. All right, so I am going to, if I can find my, hmm. there's a timer somewhere on here. Well, okay, it's 10.30, so we're gonna say at 10.40, we'll come, well, 10.45, we will come back. Um, and as soon as I find the timer, I'll post that timer for you guys. All right, so we'll give it 15 minutes, 10.45. Oh, wait, oh, wait, I'm seeing a hand. Seeing a hand. Kenneth, if you have a question, can you chat or do you want me to unmute you? Here, Kenneth, I'll unmute you and you can unmute yourself and talk. Oh, go ahead. We can hear you. Kenneth, did you have a question? How you doing, brother? Good. Okay. We're going to go ahead and take a break for 15. We'll be back at 1045. Hi, everybody. We are back from break. So the next presentation that we are going to do is the HHW sorting exercise. In person, when we are in person with this class, we do actually uh, have different household hazardous waste containers uh, at people's seats. And we ask everybody to look at the, the at what they have, see if they can identify it, see if they can figure out exactly what they have on the site, what, what the characteristics are. Well, we can't do that in this class. So we're gonna do something just a little bit different. Um, and when we get back in person, we'll go back to the way we used to. But first I want to go through and kind of refresh your memory on what, how to identify the hazards and what we you learned in basic training. In order for a waste to be categorized as a hazardous waste, it falls into either into a category. Um, and the four categories are ignitable or flammable, corrosive, reactive, toxic. So that's what you're looking for. And if you remember, it's the I can remember that. And then there are such there are uh, things that will that may come across that you're not sure is it hazardous is it not hazardous what is it or it's unknown. Uh, when we did this exercise, we did throw in some non-hazardous. We also had some unknowns, which were basically unlabeled containers. What do you do with those? Um, and we will talk about that at the end of this section. But we don't have any of those for this right now because it wouldn't make any sense given the activity. So when you look at the containers, you're going to look, this is an ignitable. You see propane, you see fuel, it's ignitable. The works. So you're looking at that and it's like, hmm, what, what is in that? What makes it hazardous? It's corrosive. Think about it. It's breaking up whatever's in the drain. It is corro it's cleaning out the corrodives. It's breaking it down. And then toxic. I mean, if you've got something that is a killer, uh, it is out to kill ants and roaches, and it says toxic, keep out of reach of children. You, you know, it's toxic. So when we talk about ignitable, we are looking for something that burns or ignites easily. The label is going to say it's combustible, it's flammable. It's going to say do not use near heat or flame. Do not smoke while using this product. Uh, you've got paint, automotive products, thinners, and other solvents. Those are the most flammable items in your household. Corrosive. So what are we talking about? If you look at the label, you're going to see danger, corrosive, causes burns to skin and eyes on contact. That's what you're looking for for corrosives. It is going to burn your skin. It's going to burn your tissues. It could burn your clothes, other materials. Uh, the label is going to say 
uh, causes severe burn on contact, can burn your eyes, your skin, your throat. Um, you're thinking about your, your drain cleaners, your oven cleaner, toilet bowl cleaners. Those, those are corrosives. They are corroding whatever it is that is making that item gunky. I can give you an example. I went, I had never cleaned an oven before. I had always had a self-cleaning oven. So I was like, oh, you know, we're getting ready to move. Let me, I'll clean out the oven. I had oven cleaner. I had my gloves on. I went in and I, I followed the instructions, did what it said to do and spray down the, the interior of the oven. And I literally, after about two seconds went, I can't do this. And I shut the oven and I'm going, what am I going to do now? <laughs> and it was because I, it was so um, unnerving. My eyes were burning. My throat was burning. I could not breathe. And I looked at my husband. And I said, yep, that's all you. I can't. And not do this. Um, and it, that's an example. I mean, it's so corrosive. It's, it's you just you feel it on your body. That something's not right. Reactive. This is what we're looking for. You can create a poison gas when you mix it. Um, it can explode when it's exposed to heat, shock, or pressure. Uh, the label is going to say, "Do not mix with other household products uh, or keep from heat or pressure." Um, Think of, has anyone ever mixed ammonia and chlorine bleach together? You only do that once. I was, again, in college, and um, our roommate decided she wanted to clean the bathroom, and she mixed, literally mixed ammonia and chlorine bleach, thinking that's how you cleaned, and it gassed us out of there. Um, we had to leave the, uh, the dorm room. It was terrible. Uh, you don't want to mix those things. They can cause a reaction. They can be explosive. Um, picric acid is another one that we often talk about. And if you are cleaning out an old barn um, and you find these chemicals and they're pesticides or chemicals or things like that, and they might have crystals on the outside of the container, you bump those, they can explode. Um, talking about every, thinking about the works bomb. So if you use the toilet bowl cleaner, the works, and you put um, aluminum foil and you put it in a bottle and then shake it up and it explodes. Yeah, don't do that. That is what we're talking about. It's reactive. It's explosive. And then you've got toxic. This one is probably the easiest one. You, anything that says keep out of reach of children, you want to think, okay, toxic poison. It can hurt you. It can cause short or long-term illness or death. The label is going to say harmful or fatal if swallowed. You only want to use these things in a well-ventilated area. Uh, again, some of these items can be toxic as well as corrosive or toxic as well as reactive. They're not all just you have one uh, characteristic that it falls under. Uh, and then some examples of these, you've got pesticides, paint thinners, automotive products, cleaners, just about anything is toxic. Uh, we do, te Dean teaches a class, um, uh, just an HHW class, and what we do is we make non-toxic cleaners for you guys, and we're not going to do that today, but we will do that again in the future, and we invite you guys to come and take that class so you can learn how to get away from some of these cleaners that are really not going to be very good for you or your children as you breathe in the fumes. But what we're going to do in this activity, which, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a little squirrely, uh, but we're going to be naming that characteristic. So basically, you're going to identify what you see uh, in a picture, and you'll get a poll question, and you're going to try to figure out which of the characteristics it may have, and it could have more than one. Um, and then think about how that item might com be compatible or not compatible with something else that you might have on your site. Um, and think about how you may want to have this item, if it comes in, if you're gifted it, stored at your site. So Dean, you are here. So the first one we've got, we're going to name this characteristic. Um, and it's a home defense insect killer. So I'm going to throw out the poll and let you guys decide whether it's ignitable, corrosive, reactive, toxic, or none of the above. And we can see. And don't worry if you're not sure, guess, that's okay. 
we can sit and talk about it. And some of these things, it takes some real knowledge or pulling SDS sheets out. All right, so I'm going to close that and share what we've got so far. So it's 17% said ignitable, 13% said corrosive, 0% said reactive, and 83% said toxic, and 4% said none of the above. All right, so Dean, what do you think? Well, anything that's designed to kill little things is going to be bad for big things. Uh, if you could zoom in, I'm sure it would say keep out of reach of children. Anytime you see that, that's a dead giveaway for usually a toxin. Uh, so I can't this is definitely it. toxic. And if we could get a closer look, we, it might say don't mix with other pesticides, but that's common knowledge because you don't know what you're going to get. But definitely I a toxic. Yeah, I honed in on the killer and yep. kills all. <laughs> I went, well, it could be toxic in some way. Um, it could be ignitable and it could be corrosive. Well, probably not corrosive, but it could be ignitable. You think? I don't know about ignitable. Okay. I, I've never seen an ignitable um, insecticide, but I, I, okay. I'm, I'm not a chemist, so Tyler might know. <laughs> All right, but definitely toxic. Yep. So it meets the one of the characteristics for an HHW. So this would be something that if someone wanted to bring to a household hazardous waste event, it absolutely could. Yep. We're going to give you some other uses for this towards the end. All right, so the next one. Stain resistant floor cleaner. Um, it's a clear seal. It provides stain resistant surfaces. Um, I'm looking really closely to see if I can give you guys any hints. Looking for keywords. There are warnings, there's keywords. All right, let's go see what you guys think. We're getting answers all over the place, and that's okay. All right, so I am going to close that. So we got 50% ignitable, 35% corrosive, 31% reactive, and 73% toxic. So definitely toxic. Mm -hmm. um, what else we got, you think? What do you see? Kind of hard to read. Uh, I know, I'm trying to figure out how to zoom in. It, if it's not a water-based sealer, then it's also probably ignitable. It has, that's what I was queued in on this VOC. It yep. does have 99 grams of VOC. Yep. VOC, for those who don't know, is volatile organic compounds. So that means a chemical that very quickly changes state from a liquid to a gas. Mm -hmm. So definitely ignitable. Um, and it does say eye and skin irritant as well. So that, that would mean corrosive because it's mm -hmm. burning your flesh. Yeah. So you've got toxic, corrosive, and ignitable. It could be reactive, um, but this is one, I don't think if you bumped it, if you um, mix something with it, I don't know if you get the reactive or not, the, the explosion, uh, but the ignitable, you, you can catch like a quick flashpoint fire. So again, something you need to watch out for. All right, so this one, I'm just going to launch that. Besides the obvious. Give you guys a couple more seconds. All 
Okay. I heard I'm showing it too quick. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share this one, and then the next one I'll wait a little bit more. Sorry. Okay. Oop. Okay. So for this one, we've got it says 11% ignitable, 48% corrosive, 11% reactive, and 30% toxic. So what I honed in first was this mm -hmm. corrosive. And then I looked at this table here. Health to me says toxicity. That's what I thought. And there's a three. So I would put corrosive and toxic definitely. And then you go down to flammability and it's a zero. So ignitable, it's not ignitable. You're, you're not gonna catch this thing on fire. Um, but reactivity is the same as health, which is three. Um, so I was thinking, you know, this might be also reactive. So the reason I chose this uh, picture is because corrosive jumps out at you. And you might automatically say, oh, it's a corrosive and put it aside. But you have to also look at the other um, the other characteristics because reactivity could be much worse than the corrosivity corrosive when you start um, storing them. Is that would you agree? It's possible they're they're an equal. So this is the MSDS <clears throat> health is not necessarily toxic for the MSDS is anything that can damage you or your body. So corrosivity would also apply to the health category in this. And mm -hmm. if you look down the bottom at the ingredients, it definitely says sulfuric acid. Uh, yeah. So that's going definitely going to poison you, but it's because it's a corrosive. <clears throat> you can actually see the warning with the gloves. I can't see what the third one is. Looks like a person wearing a backpack. But a lot yeah. of times those pictures will also tell you if you need PPE, Definitely either a toxic or a corrosive. Yep. All right. Reactivity. You want to find out what does this react with, of course. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. And I'll let you guys look at this this one for a little bit longer. All right. Is that enough time to look? Do you think, Dean? Or because you're being surprised yeah. too. I haven't shared these with you either. Yep. Yeah, uh, right. Yep. I think we're good. <laughs> okay. So let's look. See what you guys think. Is it ignitable, corrosive, reactive, or toxic? Or none of the above. All right. So what we got is 11% said ignitable, 22% said corrosive, 11% said reactive, and 56% said toxic. So this keep out of reach of children is what made me think toxic. Yeah, definitely toxic. I'm also seeing skin, eye, clothing contact, breathing vapors, spray mist. So there might be some corrosivity. Being mm -hmm. a deck cleaner, it probably has uh, some sort of a fungicide and a soap combination in it. <clears throat> so it's just trying to break down fats, oils, and greases. Okay. All right. Yeah. So you guys got that one pretty good. Oh, it's sodium hydroxide right there. Yeah, that's a nasty one. Uh, yeah. Sodium hydroxide is actually reactive. Um, we worked with that at Seabrook Station. We had a tank farm there, and it would, it would build up as a powder on the outside of the tanks. And one day somebody was cleaning it and they rubbed their jeans all over it. They didn't realize they had the sodium hydroxide powder on their jeans. Uh, they went home, they threw them in the wash, it reacted with the water. And then what happened is they pulled their pants out and they were completely bleached. Oh, okay. Um, sodium so, hydroxide is a reactive, but it's it probably has a very low concentration. Okay. <clears throat> so we also had someone comment that hazard that they noted that hazardous reactions at high heat. So yep. that's another 
So definitely reactivity. Might not put it in the flammable category. Flammable has to be 140 degrees or lower. Right. So. But if it has a reaction, if it's a hazardous reactive, right. depending on how high heat that is, I guess. All right. So next. Ooh. Give you guys a second to look at this one. This one's ticking all the boxes if you look carefully. <laughs> You're not <laughs> supposed to tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, so let's go ahead and launch that poll. And then we'll talk about why. And keep in mind, most of these things are things you find under your sink. These are not found in a factory or some sort of industrial process. All right, so I'm going to close. So we had 4% said ignitable, 12% said corrosive, 19 reactive, and 65% said toxic. All right, let's go down the line. So where do we see ignitable? Well, the first thing I see, I like okay. to start at the top so you don't miss anything. So I says, okay. um, may cause skin irritation, uh, sensitive skin, prolonged use, wear gloves. So that's telling me right there it's corrosive. Use in well-ventilated area, uh, prolonged breathing vapor. It's not recommended for users with heart conditions, respiratory problems, asthma. So definitely dangerous to breathe. Um, let's see, just harmful if swallowed. So there's toxic. Yep, I uh, do not get on skin and clothing. There's corrosive again. And down at the bottom in the red, uh, contains bleach. Do not use or mix product with other household chemicals. So that tells us it's, it's a reactive also. Yep, yep. All right. I don't see flammable on there unless this looks like it. I can't tell if this is a, a spray can. If it's in a spray can under pressure, it might be flammable also. Mm -mm. But I think this is like a spray uh, bottle, like a Windex bottle. Like a pump. Okay, like a pump bottle. A pump. Okay. Yep. Let's go to the next one. All right. I get calls about this all the time. So we are just not going to say, I want you guys to tell me what you think. Now let you look at it. All right, give you a couple more seconds. And then launch it out there. Give you guys a couple more seconds. Okay, so what we got, this is acrylic latex paint. 8% ignitable, 8% corrosive, 4% reactive, 58% toxic, and 23% said none of the above. Dean, what is it? Well, this says soap and water cleanup, so it's not an oil base. I would need, if you're definite to be sure, I would have to see the back of it. But usually, this type of paint, it's only considered uh, toxic in its liquid form. Uh, once all the VOCs dry out of it, you basically have a rubber that's inert. So in its liquid form, you want to handle it as, as a mild, I don't, this one have, again, I need to see the back, but once it's dry, it's completely inert. Yep. So for this, if you guys get, we get questions about latex paint, but we also get questions about acrylic latex paint. Put some kitty litter in it, dry it out, throw it away. The, this is this is not considered a household hazardous waste in 98% of the cases. You're not going to, you're not going to have that toxicity once it's dry. So this latex paint, acrylic latex, it is, we would not consider that one to be 
household hazardous waste. If you're not sure, you can give us a call, but have the label so we can see the label on the back and really look at all of the specifics and particulars. I threw this one in here because most people know latex paint, but they don't know the acrylic latex and the, the differences there. Does that make sense, Dean? Yep, sounds good. All right. Next one. Okay. Give you guys a minute. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share. Give you guys a couple more seconds. All right. So, Dean, we got 8% ignitable, 88% said corrosive, 65% said reactive, and 92% toxic. What do you think? Excellent. Uh, probably not ignitable. This is a very corrosive and reactive chemical. So drain cleaners, their active ingredient is usually sodium hydroxide, which we talked about. Uh, once they hit water, they release massive amounts of heat, and that's how they work. They, they melt all that grease down in the drain so everything can flow through. Uh, they are extremely dangerous if swallowed, but that's because they're a reactive that reacts with the water in your body. They don't have the same characteristics as a toxin. Um, so once this chemical reacts with water and it, and it releases all the heat, it basically becomes inert. Uh, a real toxin doesn't do that. So it is harmful if swallowed, but that's because. Again, it's going to react with your body. So it may not have the toxic labeling, still harmful or fatal if swallowed. So it's a bit tricky on this one. Yeah, this one's tricky. So it's, so basically you're saying it doesn't contain the chemicals that make it an actual toxic. The chem, It is the chemicals it contains are going to eat your body. Exactly. It doesn't contain a chemical toxin per se, but right. what is inside will eventually it will eat your body away and then it becomes an inert chemical inside your body once all that heat is shot right. off. It's a physical reaction. Right. So this one is would not fall under the toxic category. I know it's a right, little squirrely. Right, because it can, it can be chemically neutralized. Okay. All right. So, and this one is the last one. Our 100% natural home pest control. What do you guys think? A second to look at the labeling. Getting mixed responses on this one. Here we go. It was a couple more seconds. All right. So we got 0% ignitable, 0% corrosive, 26% reactive, 70% toxic, and 26% said none of the above. Oh, interesting. I don't. Word, are they seeing the word reactive on here? I see inactive ingredients, which kind of looks like reactive ingredients. Yep. I see sodium chloride, citric acid, and distilled water are the inactive ingredients. Right. And you've got some sort of sodium something sulfate and peppermint oil. The, mm -hmm. the key for this one for me is keep out of reach of children. Yeah. Yep. So there may be something in here that isn't normally toxic, but is in high concentration. And just so everybody knows that little thing 100% natural, uh, there's no legal definition of what 100% natural means. Uh, snake venom and arsenic are 100% natural. 
So natural doesn't mean safe. It just means yeah. it's not necessarily manufactured. Um, and the other little part of greenwashing is that cute little seal with the flower. There are three or four really good, uh, if you look at the top, yeah, right there. There are some organizations that um, companies will apply to to get these green seals or the EPA seals. A lot of them now just make their own and stick it on there so it looks official, like they they are green. Doesn't mean they are. Uh, I see this a lot with natural pesticides. They'll all say perfectly safe for pets, but kills all bugs. And I don't know how that's even possible. <laughs> <laughs> kills all pets or, or rodent killer you know it kills rats but safe for cats i i don't think so yeah all right so let's see so we talked about we identified what we see what we saw what characteristics we saw um this is a hard one dean because now you have to remember were any of them compatible or how do you think they should be stored if they come to a facility, if you're gifted them, or if you're awaiting an HHW event, or if you are an HHW facility, and you're asking me directly, <clears throat> yeah, what do you, what do you, would you, how would you do so that? I would. You want to keep your flam. You want you want to keep basically your four categories separate. But the problem comes down to reactives. You need to see what does it react with. Um, you don't want to store two chemicals just because they're both reactive. They might be reactive with each other. So you really have to read the labels. So reactive chemicals might need to be separated a little bit more. Um, the big thing is, is think about where you're storing them. I went to a transfer station that was storing all their ignitables in a separate building away from everything else, but it was the building they bailed all their newspaper in. So this building is full of paper, probably a bad place to keep your ignitables. And that's that actually ties right into what Sean was talking about earlier, where, where he was saying your battery storage, where is that? You don't want to store it near your paper or your cardboard. And Dean, you may have said that as well. You know, you really need to, to look at your facility and how you're storing it. Um, another one that draws that I thought about was that there was a cabinet, an HHW cabinet that a facility was storing their their um, materials in, and they had everything labeled it was all pretty um they had their reactive separate but then when you saw in the containers you had your acids separate from your bases however what they did is they had the acids on one shelf and then the next shelf down they had their bases and it's like hello what if one of those shelves give what gives way and then you know then you're going to have a, a acid and a base reaction and you do not want that so and i you see that really in stores in the spring, when you go to the stores yes. and everybody's got their lawnmower displays out, you'll see the motor oil stored right above the fertilizer, which those are also <laughs> reactive with each other, extremely yep. volatile, reactive. So if, yep. you, if you're just taking gonna... fertilizer or, yeah, mm -hmm. go ahead, Tara. That was, I was just gonna say is that the, the, um, the only thing I think of is that his name is Timothy McVeigh. Um, right, the Oklahoma City building. That's, yeah, that, that was a mixture of fertilizer and motor oil that brought down the Oklahoma City building in 94. Yeah, yeah it was all, household products that brought that building down. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about is you have to be cognizant of how you're storing things. And even if these are products that you have at your transfer station, then you're gonna use them. Um, they're your products. You need to know how to store them. And that kind of leads me to the last statement really that I wanna say is if, these, if you have these things that are gifted to you, because you know you're not supposed to be bringing in hazardous waste. If they're gifted to you, what are some alternative management methods? All of those items that you, we went through, they're all products. They're all, they all have a use. If a homeowner just no longer has a use for it, but it's still good, can you use it? Do you have an avenue for a deck cleaner or some other use for that cleaner where it then just doesn't end up a waste? It's then a product again. So those are some alternative management methods. Um, the paint, is there a school nearby that could use some paint? Do you have a fence that needs some paint? Um, just different things like that. So think about those types of things uh, before they're declared fully a waste. So that's really it in a nutshell of what we wanted to go through with you guys for this presentation. It just is a quick and dirty, and I know it's it's kind of tough trying to do an activity when we're online, um, but we do classes like this where we have a lot of different household hazardous waste, and we let you look at them and figure out how to store them and, and what you should do with them, what you shouldn't do with them, and whether you should accept them or not. 
So with that, does anybody have any questions before I release you to Dean in the next presentation? Looking to see if any hands raised, comments, chats. You have so many different ways to contact. So I am not seeing any questions. So Dean, I am going to leave it to you. The next presentation is the grants presentation. And are you ready for me to share the screen? Yes, I am. Okie dokie. There you go. All right, excellent. Grants, money, money, money. Doesn't everybody love that? All right, so I'm going to be talking about two kinds of grants. We talk about the used oil grant and the household hazardous waste grant. I'm going to take it by category. Uh, first one is so why should we hold these collections? Why should we spend the money and do this? Uh, so my stepfather, uh, brilliant man, he had every type of license you could imagine, everything except a school bus license. He was a he had a sea captain's license, a pilot license, you name it. Uh, but in his spare time, he used to help the local landfill in the 70s, uh, which looked very similar to this. And he ran the compactor, which they would bury all these drums and he would drive the compactor over it and then crush all these drums underground. Uh, and I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember that, but that's what's in the old landfills. I don't want to go back there and I don't want to look across the street. I don't want to see my neighbor doing this. I don't want to go to my local fishing spot and see that. I don't want to see people storing stuff that they don't know how to get rid of so long that the containers fall apart because that eventually leads to this. And if this goes into the ground, it gets into our food supply and our water and eventually leads to things like this. And dumping, of course, something you're all familiar with. If you don't make it easy, they're just going to dump it on you. So who can apply for grant money? municipalities, so that includes towns, cities, planning commissions, and solid waste districts, which there still are a few of out there, believe it or not. Uh, so what is reimbursable for HHW? Pretty much anything that's incurred during the cost of your event that is required. So your vendor expense, when your vendor rolls in, they need to do all these setup stuff. They give you setup fees, fuel surcharges, handling fees, disposal costs, all of that. If you need police support, it'll cover that. It'll also cover there's required outreach and training that we want you to do with the public. And that's not just, hey, come to the collection. There should be some sort of a, a source reduction message there. And it'll also cover the labor of anybody who happens to be working there at the time, as long as it's related. So that includes um, I don't know, police, fire, whatever else you might need. So what is reimbursable under used oil? So used oil, it could be anything from servicing a burner to replacing a used oil burner, repairs, uh, impervious surfaces, fencing and security, anything that's related directly to your collection. So that could be, uh, let's see, what's one of the rarer ones? Spill kits, uh, no smoking signs, signage, stuff like that, uh, all reimbursable. So how much do you get? What's your piece of the pie, so to speak? So, HHW is a grant match, which means we will match up to 50% depending on your total population of who's using or who's invited to the event and what you offer, how many drop off opportunities. So there's four tiers. The first one, the highest tier for reimbursement is an HHW facility that collects in the absence of a hauler. So that means they are certified as a permanent HHW collection facility. They have the training, they have the sign off from their local fire marshal or safety person. Uh, and again, they have the infrastructure to do this. That's the big part. Uh, and the money they're saving by not having a hauler coming out, we're rewarding them for that. The second highest is also a municipality that has a permanent HHW facility, but they're still calling a hauler to every collection and they're using their facility to store partially filled drums between events. So they're not, they're not shipping off a half full drum and paying full price. The next one is a town or municipality that either invites another municipality or holds, holds multiple events. So they might do a spring and a fall collection. And the last, the lowest one is a single community holding one event for itself, just its own town. 
Uh, and usually it breaks down to about, for that single community holding one single event, about seven cents per capita, so seven cents per resident. Whereas the highest one, the ones that's collecting in the absence of a hauler, they can get up to 25 cents per resident. So it's a, it's a big jump. Uh, used oil is a gift grant. So you don't have a gift match. This is money you get to keep, do whatever you want with. Uh, if you are a single town, $2,500 to for you for your facility. If you have a facility that is shared or multiple towns use it, you can get up to 5,000. This is the new DES webpage. For those of you who might be interested in checking this out, looking into it more or applying. And when you go to the home page, you see there's hazardous waste and household hazardous waste. Used oil falls under hazardous waste. Household hazardous waste obviously falls under household hazardous waste. The best way to find the applications though is this little search this site button, which is conveniently hidden at the top to confuse the enemy. Uh, you click on that, search for what you're looking for, and you'll find it. Uh, for household hazardous waste, scheduling is a big deal. This is the state fiscal year. It goes from the beginning of July to the end of June. Suppose you're scheduling your event at these two points. One town's doing theirs around the beginning of August, and one is doing theirs around the beginning of May, right about now. They have a little bit more time to prepare. So once they get their application in, this is when I need the contract signed back and returned, which gives DES enough time to get it approved by the state house. The governor actually has to sign off on it. So you can see the ones that are doing the fall collections between uh, late summer, early fall, they have a lot less time. So it's more convenient to do a spring collection for us anyway. Uh, this is to give you a little sneak peek. This is what the process looks like from the outside. Someone from the municipality submits the contract, DES approves it, you hold your event, and then you get your money. What it looks like from my point of view is this. This is why it takes a while to get it prepared and why there are so many steps. Uh, the white arrows show the path that follows. The red arrow is anywhere it could be kicked back for having a comment in the wrong spot or someone not liking it. So what to remember, uh, all applications for HHW are due by February 1st. Uh, used oils are a first come first serve. So they're a rolling application throughout the year and we just keep that going until the money is gone. Uh, the more collections and drop off opportunities that you offer, the more money you're going to get. That's a really simple crash course on grants. Are there any questions on that? I am not seeing any hands raised, chats, questions. Um, oh, wait, there we go. Bethany, if you can type your question or do you want me to unmute you? Here, I'm going to unmute you and you can, you're unmuted, Bethany. Okay, I was wondering if a town can apply for the used oil grant annually or if it's just a one-time thing. Nope, you can apply for it year after year. It's uh, used oil grant is first come, first serve. Okay, the thank only, you. The only thing that might change that is we have some towns that will apply for it and then we'll never request the money. They didn't hold a project. And if that happens, then we usually tell them we won't let them do it again next year because we want that money to go to somebody else. And it, it's very rare that that happens. But that would be the only instance where I can think we would deny somebody. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Any other questions before we get on to the next presentation? I am not seeing anything popping up. All right, Dean, I'm muting. All right. Cost effectiveness of collections. Again, this is household hazardous waste collections. And over the years, we've noticed that some towns do a little bit better than others. Uh, I've seen <clears throat> cities that pay under a dollar a pound to collect HHW and dispose of it. I've seen others that pay almost $5 a pound. So we're going to talk about some of the key things that drive this up. Here we go. Uh, first thing is the location and traffic patterns. Uh, these can definitely affect how many people, how many uh, participants can get through your collection and how much you have to handle the materials. Uh, high or low participation 
again, I told you the more people that participate, the more money you get grant wise, but the more people that participate, the more stuff you have to dispose of. It's a bit of a double edged sword. Also staff and volunteer labor. Um, usually the vendor are the only ones that are handling the chemicals, but you can have other volunteers that are taking surveys, uh, walking down the line, telling people what to do uh, versus having to pay people for that, especially on a Saturday or a Sunday. Bulbs are another big expense. Uh, the universal waste contract usually tends to be the best price. For some reason, everybody likes to lump this in with their contract with their HHW vendor. Uh, I've seen prices as high as $5 to dispose of a CFL, whereas the universal waste contract is 20 cents. So that's definitely worth looking at. If you're collecting a high volume of bulbs at your HHW event, this particular uh, contract is definitely the way to go. Household chemicals. So these are your standards, your toxics, corrosives, flammables, and reactives. You have a couple of options. One is you use a vendor, or two, you be your own permanent HHW facility. And like I said before, you have to have training, you have to have the real estate to do it, the infrastructure. There's also the liability of collecting this stuff on site, and you need to devote somebody who's going to be inspecting it and maintaining it every day. The benefits to this, though, are amazing. One thing is, is you know exactly what you're taking in because you can do it by appointment. People will call up and say, hey, I have to bring in this, this, this. We say, okay, come by, bring it on that day. It's going to cost this amount to dispose of, and you take it in. And every 90 days, your vendor rolls in. You're not paying the setup fees. Uh, they're not putting down tarps. You're not renting diversion dumpsters for other wastes. And you're in a better negotiation situation because again you know exactly what's in your warehouse what's in your hhw facility there's no mystery to what's going to show up and come through the door batteries uh, we talked about this again you can cause a hazardous waste vendor can handle it or you can deal with a battery recycling vendor like we talked about earlier today a has waste vendor most of them don't take batteries anymore but some of them will do just so they can jack up the price and they'll charge you an enormous amount Again, I recommend using everything we learned this morning. Uh, yep, and they used to be free. Uh, speak to your vendor. Let's see, pharmaceuticals. Uh, the Upper Valley Lake Centipede Regional Planning Commission had a huge push about five or six years ago to try to collect pharmaceuticals at HHW events. And what we found out is that a very small percentage of them are actually HHW. If it's a class one narcotic, I can't reimburse for it. That has to go to the state police. So you have to hire a state cop to do that. But the um, DEA says that you can't give a huge bucket of narcotics to one person. So you need to hire two state police officers to do that. So that doubles your cost. And then the year after that, they said, well, let's hire a pharmacist to sort this stuff out. So now they're paying for two police officers and a pharmacist all of which I think were about $35 to $50 an hour. And less than I think 2% of these actually qualified as HHW. Uh, most of them were solid waste or narcotics. Uh, but now there's the prescription drug take back. Uh, yep. it, this was a good program here. And now a lot of police stations have amnesty programs where they have the class one safe where you can just come in and drop stuff off. Uh, our local Rite Aid actually now has that for expired medications where you can come in and just drop them off. A lot more financially uh, smart. So this is a little game I like to play. Normally we get feedback, but I just want you to kind of play along in your head. Uh, up at the top is a category, old gasoline, setup fees, solvents, aerosols, pesticides, acids, oxidizers, and oil-based paint. And under each one, I kind of want you to make an estimate. How much do you? How much of the total cost of an HHW event do you think used uh, old gasoline cost? You have a number in your head. So it's less than five percent. Less than five percent of the total cost of the collection is put towards used gas or old gas. Used gas doesn't exist. <laughs> Setup fees make up ten percent. Solvents about ten percent. Aerosols ten percent. Pesticides, less than 5%. Acids like muriatic acid and things like that, less than 5%. Oxidizers, those are, you can kind of put those in with solvents, also less than 5%. Oil-based paint, 
60% of all expenses for an HHW collection are for used oil, or I'm sorry, oil-based paint. Actually, it comes out to be about 61% according to this. But imagine if you could get your residents to buy less paint or to manage it better. This isn't latex, this is just oil-based. So that also includes varnishes, stains, uh, old brushes, rags, things like that. So that's gonna be your number one expense, something to think about when you're negotiating. Any questions related to that? I am not seeing any questions, but the, that 61% always gets me. I'm like, geez, <laughs> Louise, if we could just stop using paint, we would, mm -hmm. or, or stop, stop buying so much paint, we'd be yes. in a much better place. Um, it, it's one of those things, it gets stockpiled in the basement and people don't think about it. Yeah, this also comes down to, hey, if you've got old paint, is it still good? Just because you don't want it, is it mm -hmm. still good? Yeah, and, uh, that's, and that's a good point, is you can also encourage your homeowners to donate it. Uh, mm -hmm. Habitat for Humanity, uh, Boy Scout troops that do service projects, theater and set design companies. There's a myriad of places that are willing to take free paint if you do the work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they don't want paint that's been sitting for right. five the label years. Right, has to be good. But, it has to be good. Yep. Yeah, it has to still work. But I mean, you know, let's let's start being a little bit more sensible about things. Yep. Okay. Does anyone have any questions for Dean? Uh, we've got one more presentation um, to go, and you guys can still ask questions after that one. But if you've got any right now, I am not seeing anything hopping up. Okay. So this is the last topic for the day. This basically is five tips and tricks that I've learned just from talking to solid waste operators, to talk, talking with uh, planning commissions. It's just my my tips and tricks. Uh, they're not in chronological, chronological order. They're not in any order of importance. They're standalone areas that you need to address when you are going to host a HHW event. Many of them will all happen at the same time. So you need to be able to juggle as well as plan. So the first one, it's pretty easy, is getting the word out, or you would think it's pretty easy. Getting the word out. You need to come up with a list of places to advertise. You need to have your, you guys need to think about who is coming to your event. Uh, usually at this time, I'd have you guys all write it down and share it, but we're trying to get everybody to type lists together and put it together, we'd be here all day. Um, but basically, you need to make sure that people know about it. You want to spread it far and spread it wide. You want to partner with organizations. So think about it. You've got social media. I know we all hear Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and, and all of these, these places online. Put it out there. I am telling you, your town probably has a page. If you are a commercial facility, whatever town you're located in, hey, they might have a page. Uh, go on that page on Facebook and add the event on there. Newsletters. If you have a newsletter that goes out for an organization in town or something that goes out to everybody, the school newsletter, put it in there. TV and radio spots. There are so many local TV or local radio spots and some local TV spots. Just put it in there. Put an advertisement in there. Uh, information at the transfer station. That's pretty key right there. Uh, when um, another place is Old Home Day. So it says vendor events here. Old Home Day. I know in New Hampshire, all of us have Old Home Day. Um, I know at, for me, when I used to live in Samberton, I would was also on the, the Solid Waste Committee. We just printed out these little two by two pieces of paper that had the dates for the HHW events on it. And people would swing by and just grab those so they could see when was the, when was the, the event and where it was, because we are, were part of a four town um, partnership. So look at that and say, okay, when is it? Use vendor events to get the word out to people, local people. Uh, tax bills that go out. See if you can add in a slip in the tax bills. Uh, visit the local schools. Kids love to learn about the transfer station. They like to learn about recycling. They like to learn about where their waste is going and that it is waste. They want to learn about composting, but tie in their events and you can tie and say, hey, we're having a household hazardous waste event. Tell them what household hazardous waste is and let them know that their parents can bring the waste there. Um, and then you've got partner organizations. 
planning commissions, talk to your planning commissions, have them get the word out on their their social media sites, on their web pages. Uh, and then if there's any businesses in town, I know we're talking about household hazardous waste. However, if you have a business in town that is a small quantity generator, they can actually tie in to the HHW event. There are some steps that have to be taken. I'm not going to go into all the details right now, but there are steps that can be taken where they can bring their waste to that event. They would, they would have to set it up separately. Again, we'll go into the steps of that. However, if they know that they're welcome to come to the event, they may also be very um, willing to hand out any flyers or talk to their customers about it and get the word out about the event. So you just make sure you get the word out. You can't just schedule an event and not tell anybody. Okay, you need to know who your audience is. Uh, every single town is different. Who is coming to these events? You guys are all going, well, Tara, our residents are coming to the events. I get that. What is the town makeup? Do you have elderly communities? Do you have young fan, young people in town, 20-somethings who are just starting out or in apartment buildings? Do you have families? Does your community have a lot of farms? What could be coming in? Uh, again, do you have the potential to reach small businesses? If you've got small businesses who want to tie into this HHW event, again, they can, and they can help with that cost for you guys, you can mitigate those costs. Uh, and then what are people bringing in? So if the year before you had a specific event and, and like Dean said, you have 61% of it is paint. It's like, wait a minute, do we really want another 61 or 61% of the cost to go to paint? No. So when your residents come, educate them on how much the paint is costing them and to educate them on either purchasing less or ha say, hey, rather than bringing your paint here, why don't you bring it to the local school, the local community center? Uh, somebody else might be able to use that paint. So it's really, you need to know your audience, know who is bringing the waste to you and what are they bringing? And you can have a more successful event where the money is actually being spent wisely. Oh, this is always the one where it's like, oh, good grief. How do you prepare for the unexpected? I mean, if you don't expect it to come in, how in the world are you going to let people know? In your advertisements, you need to include a phone number. You need to include some sort of way for people to contact you and contact a person, not a computer and not a electronic uh, voicemail. You need, they need to get to a person. Um, and if... They are to call in case they have a concern of what they could bring in. And you want to give examples. If there's a foreclosure, you don't know what's in that foreclosure, in that, in that home or in that building. It could be anything. They could be doing a clean out. It could just be old couches and there's no HHW. Or, hey, it could be an old meth lab. Um, you need to be prepared for that unexpected, is to let people know that if they have something that's a little off, to contact you. If there's an old barn clean out, like I said, or a um, someone who thought they were, you know, a science teacher and wanted to bring all this waste, that's what this picture is. Someone thought that they were, were a scientist and ended up mixing everything together and then brought it to an HHW event. These are things that you do not want to be surprised about. So people should call and say, hey, I've got this, I've got DDT. Can you imagine being at an HHW event and someone just walks up to you with a bag of DDT? It's happened. It does happen. And just try to be prepared and provide people with a contact person. All right. Education, education, education. Having people prepared as to what is HHW and what is not HHW, which is really kind of hard when you're trying to get the word out for an event, um, but you really want to determine what you can and cannot take and have that education and outreach prepared for your residents. So at the transfer station, if you have a advertisement for an HHW event, have a punch list of things you will take and things that you won't take, and then leave it as, if you have got a question, give us a call. Um, if you have a sign big enough, people will bring their phones and just take a picture of it and go home. Or so you don't have to print out flyers, just have a sign. 
and they could take their pictures. You could put it online. Um, and then who do you educate? You've got your residents, volunteers. If you are having a volunteer at this HHW event, they need to be educated. You need to tell them exactly what their role is and for them not to step out of that role. Because remember, people are not bringing in bottles and cans. People are bringing in hazardous waste. So you don't want someone just going up to the car and saying, oh, okay, you've got all these pool cleaners. Let me just pick these up and, and go put them with my used oil. You don't want to do that. Um, again, workers, solid waste operators, you guys are educating yourselves. You were learning what it is that you can, can't take. Your vendors, you, you guys need to have that open line of conversation. So the vendors that are coming in to take the, all that hazardous waste away, find out exactly what they are going to be doing. You let them know exactly what you're going to be doing. Everyone needs that same message. Whatever it is that you're messaging out, everyone needs to hear the same thing. This is not a game of telephone where one person says it and then it goes down the line and something totally different is coming out of it. Um, you all want to meet that common goal. And then the fifth and last thing, prep and landing. You may have followed one through four to a T. You are set, you're ready to go, and you know exactly what you're supposed to take, what your role is. Um, you know you have people coming in that are bringing you uh, chemicals that you, you're you like, okay, this is what we're gonna do with it. But when you get to the site you've that you've never seen before, you've never walked before, and you're like, oh, wait a minute, where's everything gonna go? That's not okay, You've you've just sunk yourselves. You need to pick a site that you know how to lay out. You want to make sure that you have lanes, cones. You want to make it seamless so that residents, when they come in, they're not driving all over the place. They're not driving backwards. You want to prepare your volunteers, your workers. Have, have a dry run, actually physically on site. Mark out where your vendors are going to go. Where are, do people check in? Where do they drive to? Where are they going to be unloading their vehicles? That is exactly the way that you nail your event, is you prep and you land it. Um, I don't know how to even, how to make that any more clear, but if you are unsure of how to run an event, talk to some of the other organizations who have run successful events. Talk to the planning commissions and find out where have you held an event before? Um, how, how did you move people through it? You need to have a coordinator for the event. It can't just be a bunch of people saying, okay, this is what we're going to do with no planning. So those are my five tips for how to have a successful HHW event. It's a lot of information. It's all going to be happening at once. Um, and you just need to focus and move forward. So with that, we have reached the end of all the presentations for the day. We are right on schedule. Does anyone have any questions? You can raise your hand, you can chat. If Sean and Dean are still here, if they wanna hop on, turn the webcams on. So if you guys have questions for Sean, if you have questions for Dean, we can't have nailed everything. I'm not seeing anything, guys. If they ask a question, the meeting the meeting goes longer. So <clears throat> ah, ah, it's not worth right. the risk, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got I got a very helpful. Perfect. All right. So guys, you for the attendees, you are free to go. I will tell you there will be that evaluation. It's either going to pop up at the very end of the class or you will get an and you will get an email tomorrow. You only have to fill it out once, but please, please fill out the evaluation. Let us know how we're doing. Um, it also includes a question if you would like to um, see what additional classes you would like to see. And I know I'm going to get this question. I do not know when we're going to be in person again. It is going to be at least until the fall, at least. Um, I'm pushing for sooner, but I don't think that's going to happen. So you guys have a great day, and thank you so, so much for being here. Thanks, everybody. All right. Stop recording.